Kabul, March 2013. Twelve years after the U.S. invasion, a year before the anticipated 2014 withdrawal, I visited Kabul. I wanted to see how people lived here in Afghanistan, the first country invaded in the war on terror. People are here, living their lives, picnicking in the old bombed-out palace, hanging out in the rebuilt Mughal-era Babur Garden, or going to weddings in one of Kabul's many giant wedding halls. The streets are heavily militarized, and the level of tension every day is high. Most of the pictures that I take, I take without getting out of the car. One major topic of conversation is corruption. Whether it's municipal garbage on the street or pothole-filled roads, corruption is cited as the most frequent culprit. One parliamentarian, Ramazan Bashardost, insists on living relatively simply. He voted against pay increases for members of parliament, and he calls out the warlords in Afghanistan's political system and the warlords that sponsor its politicians. I asked him what he thinks about corruption and its causes. Corruption in Afghanistan is in fact illegal. We have small corruption and big corruption. Okay. Small corruption, the clerk, policeman, traffic, or other small employee of state, they ask for his own $10 or $50 because their salary is not enough. $50, $100 or $600 it is the salary of Afghan small clerk. With $60 in months, it is not possible to have a small life. In the same time, we have the big uh, corruption. The big corruption, it is a corruption in high level. As minister, for example, or MP, or vice president, or deputy minister, when they uh, sign a contract, the big contract, so or for example for the construction of road or s school or clinic, so there is the commission or a big corruption. It is the reason that you cannot find one road built regarding international standard, for example. They, I say, for example, this road uh, Parliament Road. It is just it's built just for five years. So the uh, chief of company uh, said me uh, in this construction time said me we guarantee or for five years. So we have some road that destroyed three months after construction. It is a big corruption. I think some time Afghan president or Afghan some minister or MP said in every country there is corruption. I said yes. But it, in other countries, for example in France, they, there is not small corruption. When you go in administration in, in Germany or in France or in England, you want to have a passport. Never ask you money. In Afghanistan, the small corruption, it is more dangerous for the reputation, for the image of government. Because every small Afghan suffer by this kind of corruption. The big corruption the large majority of Afghan people say, we don't know, it is not my problem, it is not very important for me. For me, the big problem that when I go in Afghan administration and ask a passport or an identity card, the uh, 
clerk asked me for his own one hundred one dollar or five dollar. Does the big corruption cause the small corruption? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. If the minister is not corrupt, it is not possible that a small clerk in his ministry will be corrupt. Bashar Dost gives political reasons for corruption, but an economic reason why corruption and waste is inevitable is the donor country's commitment to neoliberalism in Afghanistan. Neoliberalism means weak states that leave as much as possible to the market. But every rich country in the world used the state to guide its development, as references like Hajun Chang and Robert Wade show in their books. Afghanistan, thanks to its donors, was not allowed to do that. Developmental failures inevitably followed. Afghanistan's commitment to neoliberal development was stated by President Hamid Karzai in 2007 when he said that Afghanistan is committed to a private sector model of development. There are other causes of corruption as well, tracing back to the occupation itself. In an article published on April 2nd, 2013, analyst Dilip Hero described how this works. In a very revealing passage, Dilip Hero describes how the U.S. funds its own enemies. U.S. supply contractors paid bribes to warlords. The warlords paid protection money to the Taliban. To quote Dilip Hero, in essence, the Pentagon was helping finance its enemy in order to distribute necessary supplies to its bases. In fact, this describes the entire dynamic of the war on an international scale because the U.S. first provides military aid to Pakistan. Pakistan supports the Taliban and the U.S. fights the Taliban. But after the 2014 withdrawal, will the Taliban come back? There are a few reasons to think they will not be able to win militarily and will have to negotiate. For one, demographics. Kabul had one million people when the Taliban took it in 1996. Today, it has over five million. There's also a much stronger commitment to education, including of girls, and more girls are in school now than ever before. In some villages, the Taliban have been thrown out because people wanted to keep schools that the Taliban closed. Interestingly, the Islamic constitution also removes one of the Taliban's bedrock political arguments. I asked Shukriya Barakzai, one of Afghanistan's few women parliamentarians, what she thought of the Taliban's prospects after 2014. As one of the writers of Afghanistan's constitution, she had this to say. Which part of the constitution they like to change? Because if anybody wants to change the constitution, that means they are against the basic principle of Islam. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Which part they like to change? Right. Would they like to change the name of Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. the first article? Would they like to change the Article 3, which is none of the laws can be implemented in Afghanistan, uh, which is against the rules and principle of Islam? They like to change that one. They like to change the judiciary, independent judicial system for the country. They like to change the elected government, which is Islam has been practicing that one 1,400 years back from now. Which part of the constitution is on, not in their favor? If they like to put the name of Mullah Umar or someone else till end of their life, he will be the Amir. Of course, this is something against Islam. Constitution is not a memory book. Constitution is the book of frames for the state and for the nation. It's a kind of agreement, a very important document, because it's not only today, the future of the country is also related to that one. So I wish Taliban and all others, which is they like to change the constitution, they should read proper the constitution. So if they like to say, we are against human rights um, convention, <laughs> excuse me what they are saying. 
because the majority of part of those human rights conventions comes from Holy Quran. So what's the overall picture? After collapse, before any real rebuilding, Afghanistan keeps going. I believe that if outsiders, Pakistan, the West, Iran, could let Afghanistan control its own affairs, the country would have a much better chance of progressing. For further reading, try our book, Empire's Ally, Canada and the War in Afghanistan.